Our first panelist is Dr. Catherine Shear, the Marion E. Kenworthy Professor of Psychiatry at the Columbia University School of Social Work. Her current research focuses on studies of bereavement and grief. In her work on panic disorders, she developed a series of scales, which are used to assess, among other things, adult separation anxiety disorder. In June 2005, she completed the first randomized controlled treatment study for complicated grief. Over her career, she has worked at a variety of, of institutions, including the Payne Whitney Clinic, where she established the department's first clinical research program in anxiety, anxiety disorders, the Cornell University Department of Psychiatry, the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and the University of Pittsburgh, where she did clinical work related to women with mood and anxiety disorders. Kathy, we're very glad that you could be with us today to share your expertise. Welcome. I'm going to begin with, with Kathy. From the field of psychiatry and social work, how does a film like Project Rebirth fit into the nature of your work? Right, and Jack, thanks very much. And, and um, I just want to say before I start that I'm very honored to be here tonight. And, um, and I really want to say thank you to Jim, especially, and to everyone else here, to you, Jack, and to Frank, um, for just amazing work in this area. And I think the, the answer to your question is, um, I think is really simple. I'm going to answer the question, and then I'm going to talk about some other things. <laughs> Not exactly, but, but the, the answer is that we don't, I think we have no idea yet because it's so new exactly how it's going to fit and that's how I feel because we um, have gotten these tapes only really a few months ago and I've had just one opportunity so far, I guess we all have this semester, to begin to, to really mine the incredible amount of um, of information that's in them, uh, information at all levels, as Alice said earlier, information that's cognitive, information that's emotional, information that brings the two together, and much, much more than that. So um, I, I am going to tell you a little bit. What I want to do today is tell you a little bit about myself, a little bit about um, myself in connection with grief, actually, and, um, and then a little bit about how I've come to understand bereavement and grief in the context of basically being a clinician. I am a psychiatrist and my work has focused for the last 10 years actually on the syndrome of complicated grief. So I want to tell you about that and what I think I've learned um, and I'm sure as we watch more and more of this footage we will learn much more about bereavement and grief and probably about complicated grief as well, which I'll tell you a little about. And I want, I'm going to end what I have to say with a demonstration of the tool that Frank has brought to us, uh, Frank and, and his colleagues, really, because there are many other people involved in, in the project of the creation of the um, vital system, which we are now using at Columbia in the classroom, and which I think all of us have used, but I'm going to show you, I'm going to sort of demonstrate to you how it's used, because it's really, it's, it's a very amazing tool. So just a few words about my own background. As I said, I've been studying bereavement, um, and, well, I've been studying complicated grief for about 10 years now, and I've personally interviewed some 300 people who are suffering from this condition. And, um, and so I'll tell you a little bit about that. But when you do this and when you go to cocktail parties, what happens is that everyone, you know, you say, they say, what do you do? And you tell them and they say, they still tell you a grief story. So I've learned a lot about grief from friends and relatives and also from colleagues and of course from the patients that we've treated. And I also am a somewhat voracious reader. And so I've taken to reading anything and everything that I can find from George Eliot to um, um, C.S. Lewis to whoever who has written about bereavement and grief. So I've learned about it in all of these different ways. And what I've learned basically is that um, something that we really all know, but I'm going to put it somewhat into words and, and conceptualize it a little bit for you. So bereavement is a common life event, of course. It happens to everyone. It, you know, We all lose the people that we love sooner or later, or they lose us. And, um, but, but experiencing bereavement, common as it is, turns the commonplace suddenly 
into something very strange and almost irrelevant. Losing a loved one, however they die, whether it be September 11th or from a long terminal illness, is like losing an anchor. It leaves a person feeling aimless, sort of adrift, uncertain, without comfort or security. Newly bereaved people experience this experience of being so at sea is, is something that we in our work call acute grief. During that period, people are often dazed and insecure. They're untethered from a major support and strangely detached from others as well. Um, because others seem to be going about their business as though no, nothing has changed. And that seems so strange to someone who feels like the, the universe is no longer the same. So a person who has, is in a period of acute grief is um, not interested in ordinary life and, again, feels disturbing sense of disconnection from other people who are interested in ordinary life, from people who are going on as usual, savoring the sunshine, enjoying a wedding, or buying groceries. The hallmark of grief is an admixture of sadness and yearning. And as my colleague George Bonanno has pointed out, it also contains a lot of other emotions. And these other emotions can kind of wax and wane, and they can be positive emotions as well as negative emotions. But at the core, at the center, is this sense of sadness, deep sadness, and yearning and longing for the person who died. During acute grief, the feeling of yearning and longing and the intense sadness and the other emotions tend to be very powerful and very, very much center stage and dominate basically the life of the person who's grieving. Um, and, and these feelings are very disruptive. You know, you really, during an acute grief, grief period, we don't expect someone to be um, sort of going on as usual. But over time, people do come to terms with the loss, and that's one of the things that Jim's work is showing us. And we saw some examples of this in the, the clips that we saw today, um, or the film that we saw today, how that, that sort of the yearning and the longing and the sadness don't go away. They don't go away at all, even when Tanya remarries or when Nick graduates from college and is no longer thinking of his mother every moment of his life. But they are, they're, they're there, but they're in the background. They don't dominate, they don't disrupt someone's life. Um, and, and we consider that, that transition to be a transition from acute grief to integrated grief. And what happens when someone develops the syndrome is of complicated grief is that that basically doesn't happen. So the person who has complicated grief is sometimes we see them two years, four years, even 10, even 20 years occasionally. We, we um, have seen people as long as 20 years after someone died who, when they start to talk about the person who died, even when they're not talking about the person, when they're living every day, it's as though that person just died last week or last month. So. Um, Tonight, you know, I basically, as I said, wanted to, want to spend most of the time, or the rest of the time, because I don't want to take too much time, telling you a little bit about how, um, showing you a little bit of really how we've, I've used Project Rebirth interviews in teaching master's level social workers. And in particular, I want to show you the, the tool, demonstrate the tool of VITAL that was developed by Frank and his colleagues at CCN MTL here at Columbia, and it basically permits students to write video essays. So what I'm going to do is show you how it works using an example from an interview that you haven't yet seen. The essay that I'm going to show you is focused on the first interview with a person called Brian, who's a 40-year-old married father who's a construction worker and the son of first-generation Irish immigrants. He had three brothers, including his brother Michael, who was nine years his junior and who was a fireman who died in the World Trade Center. Brian and Michael were very close. The segment that you're going to see represents a poignant description of Brian's state of mind. For, it, 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 it 
he's talking about an experience that occurred just a month after 9-11. Um, and as we, as we said, you know, for a bereaved person, everything has changed in the world they knew as they knew it has been shattered, and especially during an episode, you know, of incredible trauma like this. And a future without this person is unimaginable. So Brian and others deeply affected by their loss on, 9, on September 11th may convey this vulnerability in subtle ways. In this video segment, Brian describes how he finds himself almost alone on a rainy morning on the train platform outside of the city, and he instinctively moves to be closer to the one other person on the, on the platform. Brian is an outgoing man, and he starts a conversation. The other person seems warm and friendly, and Brian really, you can see, almost drinks this in. And then there's a twist that this man turns out to have Brian's brother's name. So a student chose this segment, as well as several other segments of Brian's story to include in her essay. And I'm going to end what I have to say with an illustration of the, of the um, video essay tool, which we call Vital. And then I think my colleagues will tell you other ways they use this. So this, um, this screenshot shows you the, the assignment that the students had. And you can see here, we, have, we had access to the entire um, footage in, of, of these individuals. So this student watched, that I'm going to show you, watched all of the three um, tapes of Brian. So she's watching the whole segment. Five. It's a foggy morning. And then she's thing. going to clip. So she's clipped that segment, and she's going to describe it. You can see the, the description to um, kind of remind her as she writes her essay. And then she'll click on the Save button. And she's now saved that clip. And what's going to happen is she's going to, we're just showing you this one segment, but eventually she's going to clip, she's going to do that over and over for different clips that she wants to organize her essay around. And then she's going to write the essay as she did. And then she's going to insert, you can see the inserted videos, and we'll show you exactly how this, video, this clip gets inserted. And then, so you just click on that little button and that's basically the essay, and then it's submitted, previewed and submitted. And this is, I think, a remarkable tool that can be used to great advantage to help students really focus in on what it is that these individuals are saying and, um, you know, and, and begin to describe that. And then we can, you know, as the instructor, we read this and we can provide alternative interpretations. We can help them see where they're missing something. We can use this tool in a, in a really amazing kind of way. And I think my colleagues are going to show you some of those other amazing ways. So thank you very much for your attention.